We have extended ourselves too far around the world. We've gotten involved in these wars that are unconstitutional. They've never been declared. We don't know why we're there. We don't know when they're over. So the most important thing a new president could do is bring our troops home. Thank God for the truth. A candidate whose message of sound money, free markets, personal freedom, and a non-interventionist foreign policy has inspired a generation of rabble-rousing libertarians, of which your host is one, to rage against the machine. Tonight, wars and rumors of war. What was that principle for which the rebels fought and which among our presidents only Jefferson defended? It was the right of free people to secede from a government that destroys their freedom. It was, by extension the natural right to be left alone. Not only are wars inimical to our freedom, they are also cancers for democracy. In the last 50 years, the United States has seen a parade of wars that never served our own interests. The important question being asked today with regards to foreign policy is should United States impose a no-fly zone over Libya? No-fly zone is an act of war. Now, what moral right do we have to participate in war activity against Libya? Libya hasn't done anything to the United States. They're not a threat to our national security. There's been no aggression. There's no constitutional authority for a president to willy-nilly go and start placing no-fly zones over countries around the world. And to expand this war now makes no sense whatsoever. It's against international law. It challenges the uh, war powers resolution. And uh, for, for that reason, we should stop and think. Congress should act. I'm proposing to, in, uh, uh, preparing to introduce a resolution next week as a sense of Congress that the executive branch can't do this without approval from the Congress. Why should we do this? Do you, do you think it'll cost some money? Yes, it's going to cost a ton of money. And uh, it's going to have innocent people will be killed. You can't just all of a sudden turn a switch and say, "Don't fly over Libya." You have to bomb a lot of uh, a lot of anti-aircraft sites and a lot of military establishments. So the war is on. And so nine days ago, after consulting the bipartisan leadership of Congress, I authorized military action to stop the killing and enforce UN Security Council Resolution 1973. We struck regime forces approaching Benghazi to save that city and the people within it. We knew that if we wanted, if we waited one more day, Benghazi, a city nearly the size of Charlotte, could suffer a massacre that would have reverberated across the region and stained the conscience of the world. 1973 is predicated on the slaughter of civilians in three areas in this town. Our conclusion has to be that we haven't found any evidence or any reports or any stories of civilians being killed by government troops, either by bombing or by shooting in those areas. So uh, my concern is that there was no bloodbath ongoing. There was no bloodbath likely uh, in Benghazi. And uh, instead, the civil war essentially was going to be over a month ago. But then NATO intervened, led by the United States. And what that has done is sort of level the playing field. It's prolonged the civil war. T cities in the center of Libya on the coast have now changed hands two, three, four times. Every time they change hands, they're shelling from both sides and the civilians that are caught in the middle. So we didn't stop a bloodbath but we are prolonging and perpetuating the suffering of civilians in Libya, in my opinion. It is clear beyond dispute that the Constitution says only Congress can declare war, and war can only mean the governmental use of military assets for violence. Ask anyone on the ground, even Western journalists, if firing 120 Tomahawk missiles is not an act of war. 
Only completely perverted logic could conclude that our actions in Iraq and Afghanistan and now Libya are not acts of war that constitutionally require a formal declaration by the Congress. Hear now, one of America's strongest critics of wars of opportunity, a true champion of liberty, Texas Republican Congressman Ron Paul. Think of, of all the effort the founders went to make the Congress the most important body that they are the most willing to give up their prerogatives and give it to the executive branch and the judicial branch and onward and onward our leaderships uh, in in the house as long as i've been there have always deferred to the executive branch thank you mr speaker the last nail is being driven into the coffin of the american republic yet congress remains in total denial as our liberties are rapidly fading before our eyes why do we complicate this for ourselves unless it's deliberate? Because we have a law. The law is called the Constitution. We're not supposed to go to war unless there's a declaration. We've been fighting this a long time, and the American people are sick and tired of it. It's draining us. It's draining us financially. And now we're into how many wars are we in now? Afghanistan, uh, Iraq, Pakistan, now, now Libya. We don't even know to the extent to what how much we're involved in these countries. So we in the Congress demand or should demand our responsibilities again. It should be up to us when we go to war and not to the executive branch. And now the final nail is placed in the coffin of congressional responsibility for the war power, delivering this power completely to the president, a sharp and huge blow to the concept of our republic. Even today, we're waging war in Libya without even consulting with the Congress, similar to how we went to war in Bosnia in the 1990s under President Clinton. You know, my, my argument is based on over a decade's worth of research. I've done research on the ground in Bosnia, in Kosovo, in Rwanda. I've also researched Darfur, Iraq, Afghanistan. And what you find is that rebels often use the same propaganda tactic. They start a war that they cannot win on their own, and the whole goal is to drag in the United States and its allies on their side. And the only way to get the U.S. to come in on their side is to claim that the government is going to massacre civilians. They did it in Bosnia, and it worked. They did it in Kosovo, it worked. But are you suggesting that you would support some kind of international coalition to go in and do in Syria what we're doing now in Libya? If uh, Assad does what Gaddafi was doing, which is to threaten to go house to house and kill anybody who, who's not on his side, there's a precedent now that the world community has set in Libya, and it's the right one. We're not going to stand by and allow this Assad to slaughter his people. This is the gun, and this is the satellite mobile phone. This is the graphic video filmed by someone in the crowd. It shows the last chaotic moments of the former dictator. Gaddafi is seen clearly alive, dazed and bloodied from his wounds. He's dragged off the vehicle, surrounded, swept along by the crowd. In these moments, with shouts in the background of keep him alive and the sounds of gunfire, it appears he is killed. It remains difficult to establish how. According to a doctor who examined his body, he was fatally wounded by a bullet in his intestines following his capture. We came, we saw, <laughs> he died. <laughs> did it uh, you never like to see anybody come to the kind of end that he did. Uh, but I think it obviously sends a strong message uh, around the world to dictators that yeah. uh, people long to be free and uh, they need to respect the human rights and, and the universal aspirations of people. So we came, we saw, <laughs> he died. <laughs> did it because we went to war when we shouldn't have gone to war. Thank God for the truth. What did we do with Libya? We talked to them, we talked them out of their nuclear weapon, and then we killed them. So it makes more sense to work with people. Neoconservatives who now want us to be in serious want us to go to Iran and have, have an, another war. No evidence. It's no different than it was in 2003. You know what I really fear about what's happening here? It's another Iraq coming. Is war propaganda going on. And... Uh, and we're arguing, to me, the greatest danger is that we will have a president that will overreact, that we will soon bomb Iran. I'll make sure Iran knows of the very real peril that awaits it if it becomes nuclear. In the Gingrich administration, we would not keep talking while the Iranians keep building. 
that they do not tear down those facilities, we will tear down them ourselves. You will do everything in your power to prevent Iran from acquiring a nuclear weapon. And indeed, Mr. President, we are counting on you. So there should not be a shred of doubt by now. When the chips are down, I have Israel's back. War drums are being much louder than they need to be. We need to defend our country, but we don't need to be the aggressor nation. Congressman Ron Paul. We got to get it in a proper context. Right. We don't need another war. Understood. And you make that point quite a lot. Thank God for the truth. We don't need another war. Understood. We have to bomb so many countries. Why are we in? I have 900 bases, 130 countries, and we're totally bankrupt. How are you going to rebuild the military when we have no money? How are we going to take care of the people? What can history teach us about war and debt? Roman government lied, cheated, and stole from its own people. And when the people discovered this, massive inflation ensued. When the value of the coins they were minting began to eat into the economic power of the Roman elites, they turned increasingly to the military. You see, the Romans had this crazy idea that they could become rich by fighting wars. They actually thought that by taxing people and using the taxes to buy military hardware and using the hardware to conquer foreigners and instilling Roman culture in those foreigners, they, the Romans, would somehow be prosperous. Instead, they spent themselves into a decline they couldn't get out of. The Roman elites had become accustomed to a lifestyle only available to them from cheap labor, labor and government theft. And the masses were kept happy by bread and circuses the Roman emperors gave away with the wealth they had stolen through inflation and taxes. Sound familiar? It should. The United States is the most powerful force in the world since the Roman Empire. We have 900 permanent military installations around the world. And we are going down the same road that the Romans did. We are expanding our empire through wars of choice. We are devaluing our currency. We are allowing the government to bribe us with the money it has taken from us. We've spent $4 trillion of debt in the last 10 years being bogged down in the Middle East. And we don't have the money. So I don't believe I'm going to get the conversion on the moral and the constitutional arguments in the near future. But I'll tell you what, I'm going to win this argument for economic reasons. Just remember when the Soviets left. They left not because we had to fight them. They left because they bankrupted this country. And we better wake up because that is what we're doing here. We're destroying our currency. We have a financial crisis on our hands. I have something different to offer. I emphasize civil liberties. I emphasize a pro-American foreign policy, which is a lot different than policemen of the world. I emphasize, you know, monetary policy and these things that the other candidates don't, uh, don't talk about. But I think the important thing is the philosophy I'm talking about is the Constitution and freedom. And that brings people together. It brings independence in the fold and it brings uh, Democrats over on some of these issues. So therefore, I see this philosophy as being very electable because it's an American philosophy philosophy is the rule of law thank God for the truth the United States of America was forged in a war the American Revolution after the rebels defeated the king we were blessed with something unique in history a founding document the Constitution which was not imposed upon the people but rather was ratified by them and which set out to establish strict limits on the new federal government the whole purpose of the Constitution was to keep the government off the people's backs you've heard that before to assure that the new government here would never be as destructive of freedom and property as the king had been to guarantee that the government is the servant and the people are the master still a revolutionary idea even today more than 230 years later if you do not protect liberty across the board, it's a First Amendment type issue. We don't have a First Amendment to so, so that we can talk about the weather. We have the First Amendment so we can say very controversial things. So I believe it was Rousseau who said, when the social contract is broken, the people must revolt. It's up to the people. Revolt now or be a debt slave. I think it would be better for the Republican Party if you left the Republican Party. A lot of Republicans are spending a lot of time, how do we keep Ron Paul in the tent? How do we make sure he doesn't go third party? I don't think anyone should plead with him not to run or stay in the party, and I would be comfortable 
in a general election. If Mitt Romney or Rick Santorum or Newt Gingrich were standing as the Republican in the Reagan tradition and debating both Barack Obama and Ron Paul.